The supermarket is a very treacherous environment if you're trying to eat well or eat healthily. It's a very sophisticated landscape that's been designed to extract as many dollars from your wallet as possible. Everything from the music, the number of beats in the music you hear, to the location of products on the shelves, to the layout of the whole thing is designed to get you to buy as much as possible. So for example, the milk will always be the maximum number of paces from the door. And the reason is that most people want to go get a quart of milk and they want them to pass as many other things on the way as possible. So the path to the milk will um, have many, many temptations along it. The height of items in the supermarket, the eye level, is the most profitable items, the highest markup. Lower profit items that might be better for you are at the bottom. So you'll always see the highly processed cereals up here, and maybe the oatmeal, less processed, less profitable down here. In general, the supermarket is laid out so whole foods are on the perimeter. By whole foods, I mean unprocessed, real food, whether it's produce, milk, fish, meat. And in the middle is the most profitable, highly processed junk food. So one way to navigate the food market if you're concerned about your health and you're trying to avoid eating a lot of junk is try to shop along the edges and try not to go into the middle or go into the middle as little as possible uh, and you'll do a lot better. Okay, so what are we doing today? We're doing shopping. Yeah, yeah we're doing shopping. So it's, it's good to have a guide to shopping. So he's a professor of journalism at uh, the University of California. Uh, also a uh, food writer and activist. Okay, about a few weeks ago, we we looked at the global Fortune 500 global, uh, and number one in 2005 was uh, not Asda but Walmart. And then we, we noticed the big changes between 2005 and 2010. Obviously, 2007 and 2008 were in between, and they had a massive impact. General Motors were no longer there. We had uh, three, I think, Chinese state companies, and we had. Japan Post. Now, Japan Post is a bit odd because you know, they've been privatizing and, and they didn't. And, uh, so where was Walmart after all this disruption between 2005 and 2010? Can anyone remember? Dennis? Was it number three? This is, this is like a Dutch orchard. Let's have a look. Where was it? Okay, so big disruption, 2010. It was number one. It was still number one by revenue. And I remember Christian when he came to this meet the bankers thing, he said, Merrill Lynch, who were taken over by Bank of America, had more in common with Walmart than they did with Bank of America. At least they shared the same kind of floor space. I think it's been a little bit ironic, but I kind of know what he means. Anyway, dominant player. So who's the dominant player in Britain? I probably don't need to even ask you this. This is from DEFRA's 2010 statistics there. They very conveniently released their pocketbook of stats. It's not pocket size, it's kind of A4 size, but it's electronic. And this is the most up-to-date I can get from Detra. Detra is strange because when I was growing up, as it were, and through most of my life it was the Ministry of Agriculture, it was math or one thing or another, it's the only ministry with responsibility for agriculture that doesn't have agriculture in its name. So Detra, Department of Environment, Food, and rural affairs, but world's math ministries of agriculture, fisheries, and food. But it's been DETRA for quite a while. Anyway, these are DETRA statistics and Tesco's 25%. 25% it depends on your definition because this is food sales, and Tesco's and Walmart, as represented by ASDA in the UK, and Sainsbury's, and possibly Morrison's as well, though. I'm not sure about Morrison's. I'm just going on my own shopping experience. They do sell lots of other items other than food. I believe Tesco's sell more cleaning products. Uh, I mean, what do you call them if that's human cleaning products? Uh, hygiene products, that's what I mean. So shampoos, soaps, toothpastes, toothbrushes. They sell more of those items than boots and super drug put together in the UK. But this is just a food sale, so 25%. So quite big. What are we going to do today? We're going to look at shopping. So we're going to look at the rise of shopping, we're going to look at the rise of shops, we're going to look at the rise of chain stores, so more than one shop, more than two, <coughs> more than three or four, and the power of these large chains of shops. And then we're going to look at from retail price maintenance to every little house. Okay, so where do we start? With? Well, we could start with Napoleon, couldn't we, and the nation of shopkeepers. England does look different, different to France. It looks different to France partly because of the enclosure movement. 
So fewer people lived on the land. And this is kind of Bob Allen, who's heard of Bob. Who's read any Bob Allen? Britain, British Industrial Revolution in Global Context in 2009 and 2010. Worth having a look, anyway. Urbanisation happens rapidly, and Britain is you know, a leading player, if you like, in terms of urbanisation, and it precedes industrialisation. So fewer people are living on the land. Let's look at it, maybe at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, getting compar comparative stats is always complicated by the fact that some countries aren't countries, and, and they kind of move around a little. And that's problematic. But anyway, let's sort of roughly pick these stats here. And so Britain, at the eve of the first Industrial Revolution, 1840, Germany in 1900, Netherlands in 1900, small country, France, bigger country in 1910, proportion of working, of men working in agriculture. And so, considerably less in Britain, considerably earlier than these other advanced industrial economies. A lot of the innovations that lead to Britain's first industrial revolution comes from the Netherlands, a small country, a small country that has a high proportion of the population in agriculture. Does it matter? Let's look slightly more up to date. So probably around the time that, hmm, don't know, that your parents were born, say. So yeah, Britain looks like it has a very small proportion of the labour force, so this includes women at this stage, yeah, women, and agriculture also. Agriculture includes fishing as well, because this is, we're now in the era of, I don't, I'm not sure if the title was accurate, but the statistics are of Ministry of Agriculture, Fisheries and Food. So it's fishing as well, it's primary sector, the primary sector other than mining and extractive industries. So it's a different statistic from the statistic we saw earlier, and, and it includes women, it includes, so it's labour force in 1961. So considerably less, I mean, Germany has well over three times more, uh, so France four times more than Britain as a percentage of the total. <coughs> well, I was going to uh, give you the answer at this stage, but I'll, 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 I'll hold you back back. I'm not writing an essay after all. Okay, so does it matter? Uh, well, well, it kind of does. When we look at percentages of the labour force in agriculture and percentages of GDP derived from agriculture, the higher it is, generally, the, the lower along the kind of development path, the lower on the income path you are, generally. And you'll notice here there's a kind of lag factor. This is, <coughs> this is if you like, W. Arthur Lewis's surplus labour here. So, so as a declining proportion of income is derived from agriculture, there's still a kind of stickiness of labour that stays in agriculture. And this is, this is your kind of surplus labour. Arthur Lewis, former lecturer at the LSE, former lecturer a bit like me at the LSE, sort of, I don't know, you know, very junior, temporary sort of post, but the first black lecturer in Britain. And he went on to do many, many great things which I'm very unlikely to follow him. Okay, so census of agriculture in 1981. So, the middle of Thatcher's real depression. This is when the 1922 committee, the men in the grey suits, are knocking on her door. You know, this is when the inner cities were burning last time. They were burning this summer. Um, they were burning in 1981. Percentages in agriculture. So we are, we, obviously the scale has changed, but we, we're still looking unrepresentatively small in terms of the proportion in agriculture. Is this a good thing or a bad thing? And what's the implications in terms of retail? Let's take it slightly closer to where we are now. Again, the scale has cho changed the game, but we're still looking. We're still looking like we have a very small proportion of agriculture. I think this, the total numbers here are something like I think there's 60,000 farmers left in the United Kingdom, and uh, I'm looking at UNA, the United Kingdom, and Northern Ireland. I think all Lyon is included in that total. So it's not very many. It's an endangered species. Dennis. Do you know what it is like in the US? Do I know what it is in the US? Oh. Um, as in a total or a proportion? Yeah. It will be higher than Britain. It will be significantly higher than Britain. And it will look more like, I would think it would look more like Germany, if not more like France. Uh, think of America. We all think of America as in big shops, big cities. But America isn't like that. America is small town and rural, isn't it? And so I would think, offhand, no. But have a look at UN stats, have a look at World Bank stats, and have a look at the proportion of agriculture, the proportion employed in agriculture, and the proportion of GDP derived from agriculture. Bear in mind, the US is the largest agricultural exporter in the world. 
even now. Brazil is second, I think. Okay, so Britain looks different. So more people had to shop. Less people had uh, you know, a goat or a cow in their garden and chickens. And uh, obviously Napoleon's comment wasn't complimentary. Uh, and he saw f French peasantry and French relative self-sufficiency as a strength, not a weakness. Well, I've been suggesting all along, maybe implicitly, that, that this, is a, this is a weakness. But for Napoleon, it wasn't. This was a strength. And, you know, when you can trade, maybe it is a strength, but self-sufficiency comes into its own and would have come into its own twice in the last century, big time. So when Britain is cut off from global trade, suddenly it's hugely problematic having such a small proportion of the workforce in agriculture. Okay, but is it still important now, having this large agricultural workforce and and a kind of culture that sees a peasantry and a self-sufficiency in agriculture as important. Having said all this, Carrefour are big, are they not? I mean, I think uh, Walmart might be the biggest, I believe Carrefour are maybe the second largest in the world. Okay, French chain of uh, uh, supermarkets. But when you're in a Carrefour, or at least a Carrefour in France, and you're looking along the aisles of certain items, particularly items that French agriculture does well, you will struggle to find non-French cheeses, you will struggle to find non-French wines. Okay, so food imports. Is it all just about economic efficiency? So in 1962, again about the time that your parents were born, Britain is highly dependent. Look at the Netherlands. Netherlands is a tiny country. France is a big country. You would you'd expect France having a similar or smaller population than Britain with being about three or four times as big, yeah. So to have this kind of ratio of imported, this proportion of imported uh, food. And Britain, Britain is huge, but Germany and the Netherlands are unusual maybe. The Netherlands is a very small, but the Netherlands has very advanced agriculture. Most of Britain's agricultural innovations, like its banking innovations, we talked about Dutch East India Country, we talked about George Stock, joint stock companies, um, and those being Dutch innovations, innovations that Britain used successfully and globally. Well, agriculture also. Okay, but Britain is small, densely populated, high, highly urbanised and with good transport links. And it's had good transport links for a, for a very long time, good transport links to its dense urban sectors, uh, which means that shopping is relatively easy and supplying shops is relatively easy. And home production, we're an island, we're a trading nation, Bob Allen again, uh, the British Industrial Revolution and global concepts, trade is important. So, so home, it makes imports relatively, in almost a Ricardian sense, uh, relatively cheaper. Maybe the problem was wrong though. England wasn't a nation of shopkeepers because there weren't shops, but it was a nation of shoppers. And maybe we still are a nation of shoppers. But shops take a while. I mean, we all take shops for granted, but it's relatively recently that the, the word is kind of stationary, permanent, open every day, outlets. I mean, these, these derive from weekly markets. And early on, you need to have re reached a significant level of economic development to be able to have that kind of fixed investment in a shop that's open every day. You need the density of population. And they were generally family run and they were single, they were single shops, and each shop ran one. And mostly they looked very much like the markets that they replaced, the weekly markets they replaced, and they sold everything. As you go to more peripheral areas, and I mean that, I mean that in a geographical sense, I suppose, rather than an economic sense, that it does have economic implications. Uh, you will find that the shops do not close. So if you go to the Outer Hebrides, if you go to South Lewis or Barra or the Isle of Lewis, some of the shops will look like old-fashioned shops. They will sell everything, everything from a pin to an anchor. And, uh, and some of them will be like the first shops. They will be cooperative shops because it doesn't make economic sense to be able to supply these shops profitably or profitably enough, maybe. Okay, uh, but as the tax grew, shops began to specialise uh, in the butcher, the paper, the canvas, the I can't remember how that nursery rhyme goes, but I remember doing it with a, with a dandelion. And these kind of 
individually owned shops began to be replaced by chain stores. Again, mostly non-food though. Although I have a food chain store there. I have a food chain store there partly because it's quite an interesting one. I think the, this name still exists, so it's not the same shop, uh, it's not the same ownership. But this is a poultry and fishmonger. And it was owned by Lord Leverman, who had a chain of these. There's a chain of these called this, and also called Mook Fisheries, I believe. Uh, I, I just not. And Lord Leverhome um, was the founder of Lever Brothers. Lever Brothers became Unilever, we've talked about them before. Unilever are the biggest wholesaler of ice cream, amongst other things. I think they own Ben and Jerry's and Wolves. They also own a lot of cleaning products, so um, detergents and lots of other products that maybe I should use and don't use. But I should know what they're called. So Sure, de sure Detergent. Is it detergent? No, it's a, an ent uh, interpersonal, whatever it is. Uh, a number of these things, they're, they're they're big, they're big um, competitors of Procter & Gamble. I think they make uh, you know, lo lo lots of products. Anyway, in 1918, so before the end of the First World War, Lord Lever who went on holiday to the Isle of Lewis uh, uh, and bought it. And then wanted to do something for the population, so poultry and fish, and, and set it up really quite large scale. And they only, I believe, I might be wrong, I believe Unilever, uh, so they, be, they, be, they were Lever Brothers, and then they were Unilever. I believe Unilever only divested themselves of this chain of outlets in the 1970s. So it, it persisted for quite a time. But anyway, I digress, but it was these kind of things, mostly non-food initially, that were chains. Non-food items that were, that were chains of privately owned shops. The other things were, were, were these kind of penny stores, like Marks and Spencer's in its origin, aimed at the working class, aimed at working class disposable income, which wasn't great. And so it was 1D, one old penny, there were 12 old pennies to a shilling. A shilling was replaced by five penny bits. Um, it was a small amount of money. Bear in mind, only the working class went shopping. Yeah, middle class people didn't go shopping. Middle class people sent their servants shopping. I wish I was middle class because I hate shopping. I would like someone else to do my shopping. I'd like someone to do my shopping tonight because I've got to go shopping. But unfortunately, I'm not middle class and I'm not living, living in this era. So I have to go shopping myself. But most of the shops then were aimed at the working class or they were aimed at working class people shopping for middle class people. We'll come back to that. And the first chain of shops that sold food were cooperatives, like some of these in South Uist, on Barra, on, in the peripheries of, uh, of the United Kingdom to this day, are cooperatives of, of one sort or another. So they're, they're, they're owned by the people who use them. The big one being the cooperative, who currently, we will come back to their market share at the moment, their, their market share almost doubled recently. It's still pretty small. But why did it almost double recently? Does anyone know? Did they buy Somerville? They bought Somerville, absolutely. They bought another, another multiple uh, called Somerville. Uh, and the Somerville name has almost disappeared, hasn't it? So in their final year of existence, I believe they won BBC Radio Force Food and Farming Retailer of the Year Award, Somerville. <coughs> um, partly because they don't do what the other big ones do. They allow their local managers to have discretion in their purchasing, whereas Tesco's, uh, Tesco, Sainsbury's, uh, Asda will have central purchasing. Just because you live in a dairy producing area doesn't mean you're going to buy local cheese, for instance. Okay, but some fields were different. Rise of multiples. As we said, they were especially successful in things other than food initially. Some of them survived, so, and some of them don't. So, Marks and Spencer obviously survived. Marks and Spencer's, Marks and Spencer's, food's too expensive and the clothes are too cheap. That's the, uh, that's the problem with Marks and Spencer, or, or, or you know, part of the problem with Marks and Spencer. Having said that, Marks and Spencer pulled out of France hmm, 10 years ago, maybe. They just reopened their Paris store a couple of days ago, and there was a queue of people outside. So the first store to reopen in Paris, um, which is going to be a bit, a bit like the food and farming something, yeah, in the sense that they are going to look different. They are going to be French and they, they, they are going to have central purchasing. They're not going to look like Marks and Spencer's and Riffin. And this is this is in early boots. And and what they what they what they do 
They vertically integrate some of these, okay? Marks and Spencers, not so much, or not directly. They have long-term and, and quite uh, strong links to their supplies, but boots actually produce some of the generics that they sell, and, and still do. More of this kind of, these kind of one dish, these one penny shops, okay, Woolworths. Woolworths was on our high street until relatively recently. My children tell me, because I miss Woolworths, my children tell me that Woolworths is there on the internet. Uh, and, and it's there, in, it's an American shop. Uh, a lot of these innovations are American, so, so we'll, we'll come back to that as well. Um, but a lot of the early multiples were shops like Woolworths which in many ways is not that far removed from the weekly market, selling a little bit of everything, and selling it cheaply and a uh, kind of working class market. Okay, so I mean, uh, cooperatives began to, in the interval period, lose ground to the new multiples. Okay, so vertically integrated, things like Boots we just talked about, and Burton's, which doesn't have a high street presence anymore, I believe. The Burton's would manufacture the suits. I put Burton's there because I remember Burton's in some pop music songs from uh, you know, when I was young. But anyway, they also were vertically integrated. Though you probably see quite a lot of shops that no longer exist, and I'll have to ask you because we do come across HMV, and I was scratching my head today, I should Google it, I suppose, as you all would do, and checked it out on Wikipedia, but does HMV still exist? Yeah. It does, yeah. okay, that's good. Um, okay, um, uh, but it's a difficult market for HMV, yeah? It's very difficult publishing, yeah? Uh, when there's so much free stuff out. Uh, so if you're selling music, if you're selling, uh, you're selling books and stuff, I don't know what else, what else do HMV do? They were boxes as well, or are they not? Sorry? Are Waterstones and HMV not on both Are they? Okay, so both, yeah, they're both in a difficult market now, yeah? Yes. Very difficult market. Okay, so the post-war period, this is when this is when the food thing becomes important. And it becomes important for something we'll get to towards the end, but something we came from when we were talking about mergers and acquisitions. Um, it's partly a legislative change. The relationship, the change in the power relationship between producer and, and, and retail is partly to do with legislation. It's also partly to do with an end of shortages. A lot of this period, is, so we're looking at interval period, the war, and then the early post-war period, where the problem is shortage. And the problem isn't the problem that we have more recently of you know, overabundance by the competing, uh, competing through advertising. Uh, so the 1960s, we, we start looking different, and we start looking particularly different, again, compared to our, our, our peers in Europe and compared to America in terms of how dependent we become on these, these multiples, these, these uh, chains of, of supermarkets. Um, so this is very early on, this is 1960. This is before some of the legislation that I'm talking about, um, but already Britain looks very different, very different from the US where it's taking its its retail model from, it's taking its self-service model from, it's taking its central distribution ideas from. Britain is more dependent than anyone else on chains of outlets rather than independent stores. As early as 1960. And if we bring it up to date there, this is so this was last year when Sir Terry Leary left Tesco's. And you've probably seen it, so I've just cut past this from one of the newspapers coming up. One pound and every three is spent on groceries is spent in Tesco. And last year, so this would be 2009, the number of stores that Tesco opened, so 200 new stores. I brought this in, we'll come back to this, but this also relates to um, what the guy was talking about in the video earlier on, ready foods. The ready food market, where there's a high value added, the most profitable market, is the big growth area. So uh, this is just one particular item, probably not the biggest growth item. So uh, that year, so this is 2009, the growth in ready-made soups. An innovation that was, um, uh, I suppose, canning first, and then the, and then the kind of upmarket packets uh, by, by small producers that, that were then swallowed up, um, like Covent Garden soups. And now that the growth in that year was 60% growth. These are really high. Um, high profit items, uh, but very easy to produce yourself. The growth of chains in Britain after the 1970s, it increasingly becomes food. Food becomes the, the big thing, and that's partly for reasons that we're going to. This is your one minute break, though, if it starts. 
It's for you the same day As yesterday It seems just like a clock Time is gone to the lose more fewer players You always go by and look I just love that I, I googled, um, I want some pictures about the dominance of, uh, of the multiples in that page. I just couldn't believe it. I, believe it. I just couldn't stop laughing. And I, I had to watch it three or four times and show it to everyone. Okay, so explaining, explaining the multiples. Uh, extreme shopping, I think we should call it. Okay, so we'll look at mass markets. Sorry, that was your one minute break though. Uh, we didn't need to concentrate on that. I suppose we could learn certain risk actions that might be important the next time we shop. Uh, it would make shopping more interesting. Though. So we can look at briefly we can look at mass uh, mass markets, mass mass production, branding, packaging, mass distribution, the rise of the car, rise of car ownership really, the rise of advertising and the rise of computerized stock systems. I must come back to that. Because I don't think I've got much of a slide on that, so I need to talk about that. Later. Okay, so we talked about the about class and shopping, and that uh, Persian cars were relatively small. Yeah, the real, the really big rise is, is in the interwar period um, with work with working class Persian power, but also the rise of the middle class. Bear in mind, the interwar period is not all depression, and it's not depression for the southeast, and it's not depression for southeast and the Midlands. And all of these kind of archetypal suburbs, like where I sadly live, I, I never thought I'd live in the suburbs, I thought the world was either urban or rural, unfortunately it's not. You know, where I live, in Richmond, is the archetypal suburb built in the interwar period. And these areas were booming, booming with a new middle class, a middle class that had spending power, but didn't have servants, squalid little semi-detached houses with no room for servants, and, and which meant that you had to shop yourself. So this is the rise of, this leads to the rise of, um, of multiples. And the, the, there is this kind of rise in affluence, and people can afford other things other than food. Bear in mind when we were talking about the supermarkets, the profitable items are the value-added items. Well, the profitable items are all the other value-added items that they sell as well as food, yeah? Uh, so it's all the stuff in the centre, but it's all the stuff in the periphery that isn't food. And, the, and these, these which don't look laughable when we talk, think about these as luxuries, and these are standard, but in the interval period, these were luxuries, but increasingly, they were trickling down and being sold in multiples. This is wrong, by the way. What I meant was it's cheaper. It's not until 1947, not more profitable. It's not until 1947 that it's cheaper to buy clothes than making them sell. But I, I still grew up, I mean, I'm a million years old, as old as your parents, so I still grew up in an age when my mother made my clothes, and most people were like that. It was, and bear in mind, the Industrial Revolution in Britain, the textile industry in Britain, was about cloth. It wasn't about clothes, it was about cloth. Uh, it was about cloth and thread. We didn't really do the clothing thing that well. Okay, branding. Okay, so, so suddenly you're not buying from a baker that you know and you trust. You're buying from an anonymous place. And so the need of branding, the need of branding for established products in established markets, but also the need of branding for new products. Just one little aside on the Chorley Wood process. Does anyone know what a Chorley Wood process is? So 90, something like 85 or 90% of bread in Britain, something like 60% of bread in France is now made using the Chorley wood, wood process. Do you know what that is? <coughs> well, Chorley Wood is a place in Buckinghamshire. They happen to have an agricultural research station there. The problem was British wheat and, and being dependent on Canadian wheat, American wheat. American wheat is, is called in the, in, the, in the terminology of, of, of farming and possibly baking. I don't really know much about baking. It's called hard wheat because it's got high protein. To make bread, you need, you know, you know that if you go around the supermarket and, probably, and, and do what he said, go around the edges and find the real food, you will find flour there at the bottom of the shelf because it's, there's no crop in it. And you'll see self raising flour, plain flour, and strong flour. Strong flour is hard wheat. That's from hard wheat. It's got high, high protein, therefore it rises. When you add yeast, it rises. The problem in Britain is we don't have reliable weather. We can't grow hard wheat. We've all, before we were dependent on can Canadian wheat and American wheat, we were dependent on, on wheat from Eastern Europe. We, we haven't been able to do it for a very long time. So the innovation in this agricultural research station was to be able to use British wheat or a high proportion of British wheat to make bread. Most British wheat is grown for agri uh, for amphi. Until then, and still mostly is, but you can use a high proportion of it. And it's basically, um, if you, you use a uh, 
chemical additives uh, a high hard fat content and mechanical spinning. You generally just put loads and, and, a, and a huge, much higher quantities of yeast of uh, uh, anyway, we won't go into particular yeast, but you use a much higher quantity of yeast. This is contributing to is anyone here gluten intolerant? Yes, there's a few gluten intolerant people. Well the argument is don't eat surely wood bread. Don't eat surely wood. It's difficult to find bread that isn't surely wood bread. So it pulls the baker, ships it in from France, I think, and it costs you four quid a loaf and whatever. Um, but you can make it yourself. Yeah. Um, the problem is the there's all sorts of problems that, that your body can't digest it very well. But it it massively increases the it increases the shelf life of the bread and it also reduces by about 75% the time it takes to make a loaf of bread. Yeah. You don't have to knead it out, let it rise, knead it out again, let it rise. Uh, it, you just spin it and then bung it in the oven and it works. And it ends up like that, like that pre-packaged poke stuff, okay? And this is brown and white. Don't think because you're eating brown bread or you're eating whole meal bread or eating bread with seeds in it, it isn't it's chili wood, it's all chili wood. And, and isn't it amazing? You, you haven't been in your larder for a week and the bread isn't blue, yeah? Isn't it about chili wood? Google it. Okay, so you need to brand these things to sell this inedible rubbish. You need to brand them. Has anyone come across any of this? So some of these are new, relatively new items. Okay, so this is uh, this is rendered down cows to, to spread on bread, basically. And this is a, a yeast derived equivalent. But is anyone aware of the scandal involving marmite during the last election? BNP used it as a... Absolutely, yeah. and, and Marmite came back and tried to distance themselves from BNP efforts. Absolutely, yeah. Um, what's his name? Griffiths. Did he survive? Only Jess. Okay, so old-fashioned grocers, the stuff all comes in loose. As a consequence of it all coming in effectively loose, you need to be skilled to be able to deal with it. You need to be skilled in terms of weights and measures, you need to be skilled in terms of using knives, you need to be skilled in terms of Hygiene. When you go again outside of the, for want of a better term, I'm in a hurry, outside of the first world, you will come across old fashioned shops where the stuff isn't coming in in big bags. And we have gone all the way to the checker without any interaction with, with, with a retailer. Okay, so they're now, this is the kind of IKEA school of business. They get highly paid, high labour costs workers to assemble their stuff. We're doing the job of the retailer. So they completely, anyone that's left there is completely de-skilled, including, we talked about the management, the management of summer fields and the management of, uh, of other inter integrated, uh, well, summer fields was unusual until it was uh, taken, by, uh, 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 taken over by the co-op. Management's been de-skilled through central distribution, but everyone's been de-skilled. Everyone's been de-skilled. Even in terms of the checkout, but packaging is essential. Without packaging, without packaging, you have you have people, and you you, you have people that need skills. And the barcode. Does anyone know the origins of the barcode? It's too much of a hurry. It's the, uh, the U.S. rail rail system. The U U.S. Uh, what do you call it? Rail. The U.S. railroad system. It wasn't a barcode, but it, that's where the barcode system evolved from. And barcodes are in, in everything. When you go to factories, and I want to say something about Lotus, though, but I've run out of time. I went. I was in uh, at Lotus Engineering. It's all barcodes. So as soon as you assemble something into a car, it notifies the stores that it, this part needs to be replaced. This is all part of de-skilling in terms of uh, reducing labour costs in terms of the supermarkets, and it goes all the way to the checker. I am unable, because I'm too old and too stupid to use the automated checkouts. Um, but cars, another factor, okay, another factor in the evolution of the dominance of the multiples. First in town centres, and then out of town. And the next trend, at least for us urbanites, is what? It's the kind of Tesco Metro type, and what's the Sainsbury's one called? I don't know. Um, but until recently, we were all driving to out of town type retail parks and doing a week's worth of shopping. Well, the urban intelligentsia, and these trends that tend to proliferate aren't doing that anymore. They aren't they're shopping for the day, for the, for the next couple of days. They're not driving to the out of towns anymore. So that might be, we might be on the cusp of a, of a paradigm shift. 
in terms of that. But until recently, it's, it's bigger, it's better. Bigger is better for all sorts of reasons. In terms of the costs of technology, in terms of the advertising, I can't get my particular brand of Italian coffee, the vats or whatever, in my local shop. I have to go to a bigger shop. And, and, and it's things like this that drive drives the bigger shop can have a bigger range, has a bigger turnover. It can stop a, a, a large amount of perishable. Just bear in mind, most of these things, all of these things, nearly, including the clothing, I suppose, is perishable. Perishable in the sense that they go out of fashion. Uh, one of my students was telling me that she works for, okay, we, we haven't got time for this, but, you know, this is the, the answer. One of my students was telling me that she works for cancer research and in one of the shops, and she works in a posh area, I can't remember where, Chelsea or something. Anyway, the stuff in Chelsea, and it's a bit like this in the, in the big, so this is the, this is the perishability of non-perishables, okay? So the stuff in Chelsea in cancer research, second-hand shop, second-hand charity clothing store, stays there for five days. It doesn't sell in Chelsea, it goes to Ealing. It doesn't sell in Ealing, it goes to Osborne. It slowly filters through the social, to, to, to lower income groups. For Osworth, don't know where I'm going to it, it, <laughs> I'm not going to go into that. Um, okay, so, post for expansion. Bear in mind that we're not, it's not until Harold Macmillan, we've seen Harold Macmillan selling the family, family silver, it's not until Harold, Harold Macmillan, and you've never had it so good, that rationing ends in grip. And all of these restraints are restraints on the growth of the multiples. And the multiples kind of grew despite this. Once this changes, changes, then they grow very, very rapidly. Planning restrictions at uh, all points. This was a significant constraint. Clearly, if Tesco's opened 200 new stores in Britain in 2009, it's not a constraint anymore. We'll think briefly about uh, oligopsony, we'll think about retail price maintenance, and we'll think about oligopsony. We know what olig oligopsony is, but that's me as a farmer being affected by the big supermarkets. They, they buy 99% Recently, I was beef and lamb, and if I wanted to sell it, I had to sell it to the supermarkets. I ended up doing something different. This sounds a bit train spotted. I ended up selling it to a particular brand, which we'll go into by the time. But it's um, this is one of the potential problems. Store power. So Marks and Spencers uh, had a close relationship with Coast Bayer. You've read about this in Owen, I hope. But when Marks and Spencers decide no longer to buy British products, that's the end. That's absolutely the end of, of the British manufactured textiles. Okay, and my children buy this stuff. I hope you've, you've moved on from Jack Wills. Ridiculous stuff. Fabulously British, made in China. Retail price matters. So we came across this when we looked at mergers and big business, okay? The critical thing is that this is the change in the relationship between producers who, in a period of shortage, First World War, interwar period, well, interwar period you know, changes a little bit, actually. Um, but then Second World War and post-war dollar shortage, rationing continues. Producers are okay. king. I don't just mean farmers. I mean, you know, hinds. I mean producers of processed food. They determine the prices. And the justification of this. Uh, okay, so we, we also talked about this. So the first, the number of things come in that are important for retail. Restrictive Practices Act comes in. This is the first time, I don't know if you remember, that the consumer, the word, the, well, the words, the group of words, consumer interests are used in British legislation. The first time ever. This breaks the relationship, breaks the cartel. So, interwar period, war, immediate post-war, it's all cartels. This breaks that relationship. This is retailer and retailer price, we call it price fixing, the price setting. Uh, it's a less, less pejorative term, maybe. The important one for the multiples is this one here, the Resale Price Maintenance Act, which breaks, then breaks the relationship, the price-setting relationship between producer, whether that be a few farmers or industrial food processors, Heinz, and the retailer. Suddenly, the retailer can set their own prices. So big is beautiful. Big is economies of scale. Big pushes the small out. And this is the big monumental shift in Britain. In, in, in. And you can, see, you can see what happens in terms of retail price maintenance, okay? This is all about shortage, maybe, maybe not that so much, but here, and particularly Second World War. Second World War, 
rationing continues, and then what happens in 96 block? Well, it just it just drops completely because it's gone. We've seen in the, the first statistic that I showed you how Walmart power of um, Tesco's. Um, so we, we, we do have a few dominant players. Does it matter? It's the critics will say, yes, it does matter. It matters hugely. It matters, it matters in competition. Uh, it matters in terms of the consumer. It matters in terms of the environment. It matters in terms of choice. Others will say, well, the, you know, these are either innovators in a kind of Schumpeterian sense, and the, the, they are efficient. Britain is ahead of the game in this context, as we've seen throughout the whole lecture, in terms of the, the, the small amount of the workforce in agriculture, the small amount of GDP derived from agriculture, and the dominance of a few key, key players in, in retailing. Britain is just efficient. That, and, and maybe you need a level of uh, a level of size. This is every, in every other industry that we've looked at so far. Charpa seems to be proved wrong, mostly. Yeah, uh, it would have been better if textiles had been niche market players, maybe, and had tried to go down the Benetton route. Maybe it would have been better if we'd have done that and not tried to go down the, down the fully integrated Charpa route. But maybe in retailing, we have done. It. Let's look at the stats. Again, this comes from the DEFRA's Food Stats Pocketbook. Don't be seen without one. So that's just the opening slide. But this, I don't know how clear that is. So this is UK retail price changes uh, between 2000 and 2010. The darker areas are up to 2007. The lighter areas are price increases after 2007. So there have been some massive price increases, which maybe you've noticed, I've definitely noticed. That maybe doesn't matter. Maybe, maybe commodities are just risen everywhere. Um, but let's look at it compared to other countries. So this is the EU27. This is Britain at the top, price, average prices, prices in the UK compared to other EU countries in food. And this is the EU27. Here's France. And here's Germany. So it does look as though that we, we look different in every other way, and we also look different in this. We do look as though we are paying a lot more for our food than everyone else. Okay. That kind of history slide asked me to show you this. And, and that looks good. And free pizza. How oh, I remember of the economic history slide. We've just been talking about the price of food. Anyway, so it's Monday the 5th. The venue is here. Uh, and it's free pizza to watch Wall Street with the Economic History Society. And it's a nice group of people. The other announcement is come back next week for chemicals. And it's the end of me next week. Come right. Because next, next week is the last week of term. And after, after next term, they kind of think it. Okay, you can ask Pete lots of money for this. And they're asking for a job as well, mate. <laughs> Do I have to do I have to do I have to do